This is Wednesday, May the 12th, 2021. It is the monthly SLUG general meeting. The uh, basic tutorial is Lee Lamert doing a uh, report on his soft raid six upgrade. And uh, will be followed by uh, the main talk being Steve Gomez, who will be talking about Red Hat Kickstart. And before Lee starts, uh, uh, not to belabor this, but just a, a quick, uh, uh, anybody have questions that they're going to be asking during the q and I'm just going to try to get a feel for how many pending questions we may have. That middle Q&A just being general topics, not necessarily on one of our talks. Okay, I'm not hearing any. That doesn't mean you can't come up with a talk. You know, if you come up with a question, you can still ask it later. I just want to get a feel. So with that, I'll... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, just have them throw it in chat. Yeah, well, you don't. Yeah, have to... yeah, that's a good point. Just throw it in chat. So, yeah. All right, uh, Lee, I'll turn it over to you and uh, take it. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> All right, this is a ongoing project that uh, has been kind of percolating for ten years. A long time ago, I built a backup server here in the shop. Uh, in fact, uh, that was a rebuild. I rebuilt it about 10 years ago with six two terabyte drives and ran out of space. So the whole idea is the current 12 terabyte array. I built it with six two terabyte drives. The main storage partition was LVM because it seemed like the sensible choice at the time <clears throat> although you will see it was not that smart uh, at that time i had six drives each one of them had four partitions i had a boot partition on each drive <clears throat> two terabyte per drive oh, sorry about that two terabyte per drive for swap with a raid zero 100 gig per drive in system i probably could have done 50 there and then 1.8 terabytes for data. Uh, I started on BSD 25, 30 years ago, and I like to throw all my user space in slash U. So six of those drives, RAID 6. Uh, if you're not familiar with RAID 6, that is probably the most fault tolerant of all the RAID configurations. It gives you two parity drives. So I've actually had a RAID 6 array fail with three drives and I got all the data back. I got lucky, I guessed it the last drive that failed. I added it back in, rebuilt it, and the array came up and I rebuilt the other one and I found one bad, one physically bad drive out of the three that had, that had gone south. So RAID 6 is my choice for any array over four drives because the problem is you lose two drives to parity. <clears throat> so out of those six, I had four 1.8 usable for 7.1 total. So the problem ended up that of those 7.1 use, usable five and a half was being used. This was actually last, last spring it hit that. At that point I started getting drives and figured out what to do with it. A little bit of background, soft. You know, you, you hear a lot of vendors say, oh yeah, we have a uh, array, you got 24 drives and uh, hot swappable. Bullshit, pardon my French. Uh, it's, it's not an issue. It's uh, soft RAID. If you have a SATA drive, I haven't tried on anything else. It, you can fail the drive, remove it, put it back and rebuild it. I'll show you how to do it. The soft drives I've done on more than on more than one machine. I'll show you how to fail a disk by failing the removing that fail that disk in an array. Remove it, replace it. <clears throat> the uh, magic here is you need a new partition table. Well, it's a pain in the butt to rebuild it, so you just copy it from another drive. And basically, what I did was I copied it and copied the first, I think, 50 gig. So that it would, uh, uh, God dang it, doing a presentation, quick calling. Uh, 
Anyway, sounds simple, right? Well, it may or may not be. In this case, we've got five and a half terabytes worth of backup jobs. These backup jobs are all our snapshot. They run every night. <clears throat> we keep a year's worth of worth of incrementals. And when I started the others upgrade process, I got to thinking <clears throat> that LVM is a single point of failure. If the LVM croaks when I'm doing the upgrade, I lose five and a half terabytes worth of data, which is an unacceptable risk. So I need to figure out how to back up the data while I did the upgrade. I know now that if I hadn't used LVM, I wouldn't have had to. Anyway, <clears throat> two choices. You, I, I could have used a 10 terabyte external drive, which I finally had, but USB 3, which is much faster than USB 2, is still a lot slower than PCI. Luckily, I had two slots open in that chassis. <clears throat> so I dropped in a new PCI Express controller, two new four terabyte drives. And in this case, I used an LVM to group those two physical volumes together into eight terabytes of temporary storage. After that, I moved all the backup jobs to that temporary volume, replaced the six two terabyte drives with four terabyte drives, moved the backup jobs back to the new array, <clears throat> and then the fin final job task, which I actually physically haven't done yet, but that's on my to-do list. I was gonna do it live tonight, but I ended up with too many slides. I don't think I wanna take the time. So the final job then is to add those extra four terabyte drives back to the main array for about 23 terabytes worth of uh, online storage. What, so what's the bad idea with LVM? Well, as I was saying, it's a single point of failure. In this case, LVM was on top of that RAID 6 array, figuring that, well, I could add a drive, but I didn't realize until much later that adding a single drive to an LVM is worthless because that creates another point of failure. You have to have those drive in drives in the underlying RAID 6 to be fault tolerant. So to address that risks, and it is a significant risk, those backups are actually disaster recovery for clients. And that L and again, the LVM is a single point of failure. So I added the two blank drives into the chassis, but be careful. I found out the first time I did it, when I put an, an extra drive in, it jumbles the drive IDs. So instead of A, B, C, D, E, F, it became A, B, C, G, H, uh, E, F. And, and so basically, the two new drives were inserted in the middle seat in middle in the middle of the normal drive sequence. <clears throat> so in this case, those two LVMs ended up, or the or the two new eight terabytes ended up as E and F. Uh, building an LVM is fairly simple. Create a physical volume on E and F, took the whole disk, create a volume group of them, create a logical volume. LV create on that BG temp, and I'm going to call it LV temp, and then just make it uh, so that device is slash dev slash BG temp slash LV temp, and I just made a file system on it for XFS. That didn't take too long. Except now comes the fun part. How are you going to move our snapshot jobs to a new physical storage place? It's not easy because every night it runs. And when you're moving, you know, a terabyte or terabyte and a half of data is not gonna be done in 24 hours. So you have to be able to stop the job, move the data, resume the drive, or then change the configuration and restart that backup. So I'll show you here a minute, couple of minutes how to do that. So you stop the job, basically comment that, comment that out in cron tab. You can R-sync it across. I did some testing and found out this does work with our snapshot drop jobs. I use AVH. Uh, there is a new switch on there for progress. Uh, I forgot to put it on the slides, but if you do a R-sync progress option, you can see it. It'll show you how big the job is and how much it's done. 
So once you have the data on the new array, you update the snapshot configuration for the new location and restart it. And then repeat until all are, all are complete. It took about two weeks to get all those all moved over for us because we were talking a day or two per job. Each job might miss one or possibly two incrementals, but that was a very minor risk compared to losing the whole year's worth of backups. All right, so let's do it. Everybody see the uh, uh, command line, the show, show window? Should we, be. we see your back show, yes. Yeah, Lee, when you did the R-sync of the snapshots, is, um, isn't, the, isn't there a problem that tonight's daily zero is different than last night's daily zero? <laughs> Right. That, that's why you have to stop the job. You have to choose one backup set and stop it. You know, you, you can't have the backup job running while you're moving data. Um, so you, you said it took two weeks because you would only do the R-sync during the daytime or whatever? No, I would, I would stop the backup job of one backup job, start the R-sync, and when the R-sync was done, I updated the snapshot configuration for the new location and restarted that backup and then went on to the next one. Oh, I see what you mean. In other words, yeah, it, whatever your repository is, there are still separate buckets in the repository once for each target set that you're trying to back up. Right. And, and you, you, you migrated the target sets one at a time while they were quiescent. Correct. Got now it, for, go on. For example, here, here is the current backup. These have been running for what? two or three months since I fin finished the original migration. And here's the old one. And basically when I got done with them, I put them in a done folder so that uh, I knew for a fact that I didn't have to deal with them anymore. So the first thing you wanna do, now here are all the backup jobs that run every night. If you, if you wanna do a stop one, you just comment, comment out the daily, weekly, and monthly. And then that will stop that backup job from running. Okay. Now, just a quick comment here. Yeah. I, I did, I'm doing the same thing you did, but in my cron tab, instead of letting that line be super long, I created a script so that the cron tab calls the script and the script runs those four commands. No, that's fine. It, it, it makes the cron tab a little cleaner and easier to read. Yeah, but it, it also adds another uh, layer of complexity in there. You know, in addition to managing cron tab, you have to manage that script. Um, yeah, but mine was getting really long because I was I was not on the, the dash C file and I was redirecting the log file or whatever. So my lines were about twice as long as your line. <laughs> uh, you do know you don't have to redirect the log file. That option's in the R snapshot. Okay. Now here's, here's all the backup jobs. Let's look at MX1 just for the heck of it. So here, here's the root directory. When I moved it, I changed that to slash U2 slash MX1. We've talked about our snapshot over the years. I will tell you that this has saved my bacon more than once. No create root. No create root allows you to abort the job if that root folder is not there on the target. So in other words, if the drive unmounts, if you got it wrong, if it's going to the wrong place, the job will abort and throw an error so you can fix it and then run it again. Okay. But that's the basic idea right here. You move after you are snapshot, after you are synced the data across. In other words, we're talking about step two here, R sync minus AVH. After you've R synced the data, you update the R snapshot configuration with the new location. Right here. So actually, actually I did this twice. A question. Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, R snapshot, is that that's not R sync or it is? Right. Our, our, our sneak does file transfer 
our snapshot does. Uh, our snapshot is a wrapper around our sink. It, our our right. sink is the is the atom, and our snapshot is the molecule. In other words, here 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 is a backup job. Here's a backup job for MX one. In other words, daily zero. Uh, what the hell? Oh. Now, daily zero was today at 325. The backup job runs 325. In this case, it maintains seven days. Uh, four weeks. And 12 months. So every one of these backup jobs, or, or backup sets, I should say, keep 12 months of data. If you wanted years, you could keep a year on there too, but I figure if I don't need something in, in 12 months, it's not nothing to worry about. And a lot of these are our customers that pay us to do the backup as a DR. Okay. All right, any question on the backup jobs? All right, next step, replace each one of those six two terabyte drives. First thing you wanna do is fail a partition. Uh, here's a question for you. How would you see what partitions are involved in which MD? Stanford, you probably know it, so let's, let's call on somebody else. How do you see what the what the uh, drive the array configuration is on your machine? You're going to use a madam command, or are you going to peek inside the kernel? Neither way, neither. Well, by peeking inside the kernel, I mean inside the kernel's journaling in the file system. Nope. That's that's what I'm talking about. Proc peeking in. Okay, proc. Okay. Proc. Yeah. Now here's uh, MD zero, which is actually swap. Here's MD one, which is home. And here's MD two, which is the 15 terabytes after I replace the six two terabyte drives with four terabyte drives. And if you notice, MD stat tells you which drives are hot and alive. And uh, years ago, we built a Nagios check. If a drive goes off, 15 minutes later, I get an email. So all the use mean all those drives are up? If, if they're not up, there's an underline there. A U would be replaced with an underline. Okay. In fact, Don wrote a Perl script a gazillion years ago to find the U's and count them. And if there's a dash in the middle or underscore in the middle, it's, it, it returns an error. And Nagy else will alert you. Yeah, I don't think it's that hard because anyway, no, the MD zero is RAID zero, it's not RAID six. Correct, RAID zero. It's just throwing those those uh, two gigabyte partitions together into twelve gig of swap. Oh, no reason to have your got it. No reason to have your swap rated. Got it. Right, right. Although it it has caused problems when the drive goes bad, your swap disappears. 
So if you're if you're watching, when you boot up a system and you're seeing error, uh, I have seen, like on my workstation, I do RAID one, and I use the two partitions in there. That's one known valid way to check if you have a failed drive. If you if you spread your swap space across the drives, you'll see an error on boot. That makes sense. Yeah. So does that mean you're considering changing that and uh, and putting your swaps out on on RAID? It is. They are. I use RAID zero. Yeah. This 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 is a swap partition for that machine, and I do that all 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 the machines with RAID. You know, okay. a it's it's a it's a clean way to build a large swap partition, and b if you ever have a problem with the disk, you will see it first when the system tries to mount the swap or the swap partition on boot. Uh, it's, not, it's not a fatal error, but you'll see, but you'll, in, uh, at least on SUSE, it'll, it'll take a minute and a half to time out. Hmm. So if your machine is taking a long time to boot, just hit the key to show your log messages on boot and it'll show you could not mount swap, could not mount MD0. Hmm. And, and that means you got a bad drive. Uh, uh, half the time, something just took it offline, and you can re-add it. You know, stop the array, re-add the drive, and restart the array. Uh, it's not very often you get a physical drive fail. But uh, you know, for those those two reasons, I started doing that years ago. Anybody else? Okay, so check with MD stat. Physically swap the drive. I have tried this different ways to be nice. Fail it. In other words, there's three MDs here. You fail. Uh, let's see, where, where's the command? <clears throat> you know, if you fail it, MD atom, manage dev MD zero, fail SDG two. And when you fail that drive, it will remove it from the array, but the, but the array itself will keep on trucking. In some cases though, I forgot, you know, in one case I forgot, I just pulled the drive out and put a new drive in. Didn't affect anything. The drive automatically dropped out from all the arrays, including it. And then you know, once I swapped the new drive in, the trickiest part is replacing the partition table because you have to either recreate it exactly matching the partition size or what I do is just DD it from one drive. Uh, in fact, at one when I was replacing all six of them, I would DD the entire partition table and the first 100 gig of the drive. So I got all, or, all the partition data in addition to the partition table. And then I put the new drive in, I DD'd it, I DD'd it in deleted the last partition, recreated it for the full size, and then added all three partitions in, back into the array. Does that make sense? <clears throat> and that got six two terabyte drives converted into six four terabyte drives. So you doubled your space through all this. Correct, at that point I doubled my space. I'm, I'm getting ready to double it again because I got another eight terabyte to add on it or add it, increase it by another 30%. Because the two four terabyte temporary drives I had in there, uh, I'm going to delete the LVM config and then, and then add them on to the existing array. Um, yeah. The part about replace the partition table, uh, did you, I mean, did you go into deep because the partition table is now what twice as big as it used to be or something? No, no. Uh, I probably should have put a slide in this. Uh, but basically, I copied the partition table from the old drive to the new drive. Then went into the new drive, deleted that last partition at 1.8 terabytes, and just created a new one for the rest of the disk. Okay, that, that was the detail I was looking for. First, you copied the partition table to get it approximately correct. No, the, 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 the right, last the, partition. The partition table was all I was interested in. The table had the 
boundaries for all the partitions except for the end of the last one. So it's the first three partitions I had to have exact. Otherwise they wouldn't go to the first two arrays or the boot partition and the, and the first two partitions. Uh, remember, let's see, where's my, where's my command window here? You know, MD0 is swap, one is home and two is you. So the boot sector is down here below MD0. So boot sector, the partition for MD0 and the partition for MD1 are the ones I copied with DD. And then yep. after I copied it, I deleted the fourth partition and just re-added it, just recreated it. As the maximum of the new size, it was left right. over. Right, right. <clears throat> yeah. in, in my case, I just went through this myself. In my case, I had an MD2 and an MD3. And so I, it wasn't just the last partition I had to stretch. I had to stretch both of them equally. Uh, in, in, in which case, uh, that would have been, uh, so how'd you do it? Um, like it, you don't have to copy the partition table. As long as you make, when, when, you, when you put in the larger disk and you create partitions on it, and each of the partitions needs to, is going to marry up to one of the old partitions, and as long as it's bigger, then your equal to or bigger, then your RAID remains intact. And then at the end, you've got a small file system sitting on a big partition and you, you stretch that. Right, okay. Yeah, the, the, that's what I had planned to do until I ran into the LVM problem. Because with an LVM out there on MD2, I tried replacing all six disks and maintaining the array. This was after I had copied it off. I wanted to see if I could do it. And when I replaced SDA, it broke. Yeah, that's, I mean, how do you, that's a good question. Yeah, L, I was not using an LVM. How do you, because the question is, is how do you tell LVM, okay, I want you, you got an SDA, but I only want you to use part of it. I don't want you to use the whole thing. And you can't do. You can do that with a with a make FS or whatever. But you... no, 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 no. It's it's more complicated than Stanford. I had replaced all six drives with the exact same partition size. When I got oh. to the sixth drive SDA, the LVM blew up. I had replaced it with a copy of the partition from the old A drive, but it broke the LVM. There apparently is some metadata that LVM keeps outside of the normal partition information. Oh, I see. I mean, even though, even though SDA4 <laughs> was still the same size as the old SDA4. And the same data. It wasn't happy. <laughs> right. So the, that, that was one of the major lessons learned. And which is kind of why I'm leery of doing it, of playing with the other two, but at least uh, the, the biggest problem I had was once the LVM blew up, I couldn't get rid of it. I had to physically overwrite the first 50 gig of that partition with zeros before I could clear whatever LVM metadata was there because it was not in the partition table. That's yeah, scary. LVM is not your yeah. friend. Do what? LVM is not your friend. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Any other questions on the six two terabyte drives? Now, I should probably ask, but nobody's going to be uh, vocal enough to say anything. The final op, the final task is to make sure you have a valid boot sector. And instead of risking it. Uh, I went ahead and rebuilt it on the new SDA before I took the machine down. And then I copied that partition to B and C. So I had a backup. So if A happens to fail, which is which happened to me a long time ago on this machine, the boot drive died and I didn't even, uh, I knew it. And then when I went in to reboot it after replacing it, it wouldn't boot. Uh, but anyway, uh, you might want to look it up. 
if you if you have a problem like that, let me know. I've got a procedure on our wiki. <clears throat> you can rebuild a bootable disk by booting with a thumb drive, rooting onto the system disk and mounting mounting it, or mounting the existing system disk and rooting into it, so you are running the current system rooted, and then you can rebuild Grub on a new drive or a different drive. Does that make sense? Scary sense, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those things where you uh, think really hard and then type very slowly and read. <laughs> make yep. sure you're typing exactly what you want. Yep. Tell me about if, it. If not, you're dead in the water for good. Yeah, and uh, th this machine, it's on its uh, second case, third motherboard, second set of disk drives, and now it's going strong. Hmm. That sounds like an old claw hammer that I used to have. It had a new head and a new handle every once in a while, but it was the same hammer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, last task, which I haven't done yet is to add those two new four terabyte drives back to the main array to get another, you know, six and a half, seven terabytes. So this is the part I think I, I messed up the first time. First thing you have to do is unmount it. Make sure you move the FS tab entry because you don't want to error on booting. But the first thing you have to do is disable that logical volume. And then do an LV scan to make sure it is show is disabled. I can't show it right because I don't have any disabled. But here's the part I think I missed the first time. You have to physically remove that logical volume so that you can reuse those disks with normal partitions. So you're, I mean, you you have to remove, you can't do this with live data. You had to, you had to remove all of your data from your RAID in order to make to let to let you tear it apart. Correct. Well, I, I removed all the data because I knew LVM was a single point of failure. And I was not going to risk it dying in the process and throwing and losing everything. Okay, it was a risk. Got it. But now you but now you're gently removing volume groups, but leaving the LVM intact. No, 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 no. The last line here removing it is what I didn't do the first time. That's why I blew up. I thought na naively, well, hey, I, all I have to do is, is reformat, is wipe out that partition, create a new partition, and I can I can make it raid. Uh-uh. You cannot recreate a partition in on that drive without it thinking it's a logical volume. Oh, so you had to basically scrub the drive down to think it's right. I, I physically had to scrub that partition to be able to reassign it as a raid. The, okay, the, the, the LVM information is not kept in directly in the partition table. It must be after it or something like that. Because I could not remove the LVM flag from that partition, no matter what I did. Yeah, what is the, what is your LVM? Is it just the MD4, MD3? No, right now it's the, it's the, uh, uh, let's see where is it here? Right here, S D E and F. Oh, those were the temps, though. I was wondering right. how the LVs were involved in the in the original raid. Originally, M D two here was on an LVM. That okay, M D two was on an that's what I was saying. Was on right. an LVM, and that's where you were stubbing. So you I mean you had to so you had to get it on some other disc because you were gonna tear apart that L and not only was it a single point of failure. You had to tear it apart. You couldn't manage it. Well, no, I, there was no way to extend the LVM without using those other two drives, which is, is ludicrous because I've got a RAID 6 array now that is much more fault tolerant than two single drives sitting out there as, an, as a physical volume. So the, this here on slash U 
Right now it's 14.2 terabytes and it will be 21 or 22 when I add SDE and F to it. Uh, so 7.2 and that'd be, it, it, these partitions are 3.6, so 3.6, 7.2, that'd be 21.4 terabytes. Once I get these two, these two physical drive part, repart, un LVM'd, repartitioned, and then added to MD1, MD2, and MD0. So you're getting, you're going to, doing away with the, uh, LVM altogether. Correct. At, at this point, okay. don't, at this point, the only reason to have an LVM is so I could physically put these two drives together to get seven terabytes of space, which is enough to back up what I have. Yeah. So basically, you you have them kind of end to end. Two fours make eight. Right. Okay. Right. Well, you know, Lee, you said that, but I mean, you could have just made them RAID zero. I guess it's possible. The same way you did your swap partition, you could you could have left out the LVM and just made them made you know MD nine RAID zero. <laughs> I would never use RAID zero for data partition. Well, that's you know, what that, the LVM is doing. Right, but LVM is a logical structure on top of the physical disk. There's a lot more data uh, integrity there you know, volumes and stuff like that. Of course, I guess with RAID zero, if you XFS would handle it. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think of that, Stanford. I just, you know, once once I had played with an LVM for, you know, for a few years, I understood it better. And in this case, it made sense because it was a lot quicker to just drop these two drives together and get a 6.9 terabyte array I could use to back up the data. In case something happened to MD2 here, which it did because LVM host. So the chassis this whole system is running on is, is it basically uh, just a like a PC motherboard with a bunch of PCIe cards in it? Well, there were six, there are six SATA ports on the motherboard. <coughs> when I put the new motherboard in it, I get I got the one with the most ports. Okay, so you're going uh, SATA ports instead of the, uh, so everything's plugged straight to the motherboard in this case. Well, the, the first six are. Okay. E, e and F are on a, a PCIe expansion card. Okay, that's, they're the ones you were talking about, the PCIe, and they're going to stay there, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'll just Because you're, you're out of ports on the main board, out of SATA ports. Right. Okay. And, and remember, I said, when you add a physical card, be careful because it's going to shuffle the IDs for IDs on you. Okay, SDA and B, C, D, E, they tend to shift around. Well, A, B, C, D, and it put E and F, and now the last two are G and H. Instead of D, E, F, and then G, H is the new one, just stuck E and F here in front of the last two. Yeah, and those are the new ones. The logical volumes of the ones that got added to the, because you added the card, the PCIe card recently after everything else was already in place. Yeah, I, I added it last year when I started the upgrade. And then okay. I put the first two ter four terabytes and drives in there. So I had a place to back up the data. And in this case, given the complexities of running or backing up in our snapshot set, I just copied the data over and then continued and then restarted the backup jobs on this copy of the data. And I, I basically threw away what was here on the old one because I didn't want to risk any failure. So now I moved everything from the temp array back or from the temp or temp lodge LVM back to the RAID 6 array that is now 15, 14 terabytes and I'm still using less than half of that. So, you know, I got another 7.2 terabytes here to add as soon as I get around to doing this. If we had more time, you know, I'd, I'd do it tonight, but uh, uh, this is about all, I wanted to get all the data out here. So if somebody want to look through the slides, you can see all the notes and the way I did it. Yeah. So is this an open BSD? 
Uh, it is. It is not. It's Susie. Okay. Uh, I, gave up, I gave up on BSD about 20 years ago because the soft raid was pretty immature. Mm, okay. And, uh, you know, I've still got BSD boxes in the rack, but they're the ones that are 20 years old. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started using SUSE for a number of reasons, which I've, I've talked about before. But for server, you know, the OS install is like three three gig and that's it it's even it's even less than bsd was and it's a lot easier to handle packages and if you need it i can run the same thing on a desktop and get whatever current tools i need that you can't with bsd but i, I still like bsd i use it um lee can you check the chat box i posted a, a path name to a check madam raid yeah, if I can find my window. Oh, here, over here. Uh, and it, um, when you put, when you paste that in there, change lib to lib, do an ls dash l and change the word lib to lib asterisk because it might be in lib 64. Oh, I don't, I don't install it. I don't use their plugins. I, I, I built my own years ago. I mean, you said Don wrote the script, but I just looked at this guy's script, Sebastian or whatever, and basically he's, yeah, he's just grepping for underscores. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like I say, when Don did it, this, this didn't exist. So somebody else contributed. I had it out on GitHub. I think it's still there, but, you know, nobody ever found it. We also did some other ones. Uh, one of our clients was running a backup utility called StoreGrid. We were, we you were say on... Don did it years ago. How many years ago? Oh, probably 15. That's, yeah, that's more because uh, the date on the file I just put is 2014. Yeah. That's, that's years ago, but it's not Don years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a new order of magnitude called Don years ago, or maybe even <laughs> Carl years ago. Well, <laughs> Carl was 06. I know because I, I still use SSH 42206 and he said, well, what random ports are we using? And I said, I don't care. Well, okay, I'll make it 06. So whenever I see an SSH port, I, I know when he was, you know, when, when he was doing that kind of stuff. So he went down there and started shooting radar beams in the sky. Well, is Don before or after 06? <coughs> Probably seven or eight, something like that. You know, back back in the o, o something. So Lee, I um, we probably need to move on to the next lecture. But when I did mine, I did not have a logical volume group in the way. Mm -hmm. I for because we started with rel five, the raid the the raid was in chunks. You couldn't have a file. You couldn't partition a RAID into P1, P2, P3. So we had an MD3, an MD4, and an MD5 that were each two terabytes big or whatever, you know, instead of one big, huge four, 14 terabyte RAID. But so then you get done, you've got all of these file systems and you got all this empty space. And it was a little bit of a chore to, um, you, you partition each one of the, you, you make each of the partitions underneath get get bigger it's like okay fine now the partition is now the md0 is big or md2 or md3 or whatever is big but the file system that's on it is still small correct and, and so you use tunefs but tunefs fights you and says well you've got all these checksummed and logging and whatever in your journal file system and you have to turn that all off before i can grow this partition I think it's not, what, what file system we're using? Uh, we use EXTF or EX, EXT three and four. We don't use XFS, but okay. you can, when, when you can use TuneFS to grow an EXT file system, but it has to have um, one particular flag in the file system turned off or it can't resize the partition. And that was a little bit scary. I thought when I turned it off, I was gonna, I was gonna 
pancake the file system, but nope, I didn't lose a single byte of data and I didn't have to switch my R snapshots to someplace else because that's what I didn't want to have to do. Yeah, moving yeah. an R snapshot file system it is scary to me. I see how you did it, but <laughs> it, it, hey, R sync AVH works. I mean, I did it about 40 times. Okay, I'll have to remember that, that that H copies all them hard links. Right. And it preserves the whole hard link beauty magic of our snapshot. Right. And, and like I say, it works because it was five and a half terabyte when I copied it to U2 and it's five and a half terabyte when I copied it back to U1. You know, with, with a little bit of, a little bit of growth there. No, otherwise it would have been like 12 or 13 if you copied it without the hard links or more. You know, I think when our, uh, let's just think about that. You know what, with, um, what's a good, when I'm trying to think how our, I've looked in the guts of our snapshot of how it actually builds the, the nightly incrementals. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it does a CP dash A. And that and that CP dash A copies all the hard links. <laughs> it's not an R sync. It's a Z, It's a CP because it's just copying it on the same same file system. Okay. Yeah. Right. You're trying to you're trying to do an R sync from one disk to another. So you so CP dash A probably doesn't work across disks. It works within a single disk. Why would anyway, she, kind yeah, of, we're, we're talking about the, it's, it's all, it's all related, but you're talking about how to manage your, how to grow your raid, not how to, not how to, not how to, how to move an R snapshot is worth a whole nother night's lecture, but you included it in this one. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Last job, add those two four terabytes to the, to the new array, which isn't new anymore, but uh, copy the partition table for another drive, add the three partitions to each array and repeat for the other drive. And like I say, I was planning on doing that tonight, but I ended up with more information than would fit in a tutorial. So uh, I'll do it sometime here in the future. And if anybody's interested, check back. Anybody else? All right, QED. Gary, over to you. Fantastic. Lee Lambert, thank you once again, as always. And Lee uh, is also our host at uh, Omnitech. He's uh, the principal at Omnitech, the boss at Omnitech. And uh, uh, he uh, has dutifully and graciously maintained the uh, Slug servers for about the last uh, five years, I think, maybe. Uh, so... Uh, Thank you very much, Lee. So. Certainly. And with that, uh, we're in that gooey middle of the meeting. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, our structure is to have a talk on the front, a talk on the back, and do the announcements and a general question and answer in the middle of the meeting. So that's where we're at now. We're in that gooey middle of the meeting, and uh, we're going to do announcements. Uh, so the first announcement is... Uh, uh, next week, uh, next week on Thursday is the uh, uh, St. Louis Lug, St. Louis Linux Users Group meeting. Um, that is uh, Thursday the 20th. And the, uh, uh, the presentation will be uh, Sync Thing. Uh, Tyler Rudy will be doing it. Um, let's see, Tyler, you, you, uh, you're on right now, I think. Uh, uh, can you give us a... Uh, a quickie description of what the sync thing is? Um, well, the scenario that I'm in is I have a piece of software that's been pulling the photos off of my computer for the last um, five or six years, and they've been, they have deprecated that feature. So my goal is, is as I take photos on my cell phone, especially on this trip I'm going this summer, when I plug it in, I wanted to go find my brand new, well, I am 
upgrading, but my Freenas box here at the house and just copy all the photos off my phone and onto the as they're every night. That way um, our snapshot can take a take a backup of it and shunt it off to my offsite backup. And by offsite I mean fifty feet about 120 feet to the east. <laughs> um so the you guys pointed out last week that sync thing will do this and I've been going through the process of getting it set up on my server so that I can move more that and I'm and also finding some other places where it'd be really nice to make sure that things on my mobile devices are copied to my server. So Excellent. Okay. So a oh. question I have for you guys, do you want me to go through the full setup? Or do you want me to just go from once you go from okay the software's installed, this is how you configure it. I, I'd say go ahead the full setup because yeah. okay. it's not going to take that long. I don't think. Oh, so the thing is, is I'm playing with the version on FreeNAS and it's literally install sync thing. So what I'll do is I'll set up a uh, virtual copy of Debian and I'll throw sync thing on there as a demonstrator once I get my slide deck built. And we'll go through the setup on it. And please number your sides. Yeah. It, it helps when we have to ask questions. Thank you. All righty. Come next week and uh, hear more from Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. You're welcome. Uh, that's the other things uh, by way of announcements. Uh, uh, next week, Tuesday through Thursday. There's a uh, Google Developers Conference, um, so it's the, an annual event for them, and uh, uh, it's free. So uh, uh, it's one nice thing about the pandemic. A lot of conferences, since they've gone remote, have also gone free. So, uh, so yeah, you can get, in, get into that next week. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Stan, uh, is there any anything uh, uh, that the the newcomers log and the uh, Slack meeting, they're, uh, they're on normal dates, right? There isn't anything funny with the calendar this month? Um, right. The, the Slack meeting is always the first Thursday of the month, unless there's some kind of holiday problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and the newcomer meeting is the fourth Tuesday of the, of the month. And I don't think there's any problems there. I would like to mention that I've added... Uh, the uh, Jitsi community call every two weeks for anybody that's interested in that. That's kind of something I like to look at. But more importantly, I've added security now to the calendar. I've mentioned it to just at about every Slack meeting and every newcomer meeting. And I just realized the other day that I didn't have it on the calendar. So, and it's something a lot of people ought to be, the security now they ought to be looking at or listening to. And it's on Twit TV. And if you miss that date, they the following day they have the session available for download, or actually they review it. Uh, they play those intermittently until they have some other session come up. Which were, which would probably tell you about the new QNAP blocker. Where you guys hear about that? Um, that one I haven't heard about. Uh, somebody came up with a found a vulnerability in the QNAP OS, so the little NAS boxes, and people are getting their files all locked up. Hmm. You don't need you don't need a, a a system cracker to come in and and uh, lock up your files. You can you can just do it yourself, right? <laughs> the the QNAP is doing it with um um. with um, 7-zip. So that's just like, well, that's annoying. 
<laughs> Sorry, I think that was me. Move along, move along. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I can't think of anything else uh, by way of announcements, unless somebody else has any announcements. Uh, with that, if no one else has an announcement, we'll go on to Q&A. Anybody have any just general questions that they're scratching their head or want to comment? I generally post my questions up on Discuss and get an answer after I've gone through the man pages and the info pages and dug into the documentation on the slice user arena. Very good. What's this discuss you're talking about? Ah, you speak up. So yes, the discuss list hasn't been very active. Um, it used to be more active, but yeah, it's the mailing list. Uh, and yeah, everybody's encouraged to, to sign up. Like I say, it's not like you get millions and millions. Uh, heck, I would say actually for the last few months, it's probably only been, what, about five, six discuss postings a week, maybe, maybe a little more. So uh, yeah, you can just post out a, uh, here's something strange that happened, or does anybody have uh, an idea or an answer for this? And we get some of our, uh, our fellow uh, Figures making a comment or perhaps giving you an answer. But well worth it. You can sign up on the uh, on the slug.org homepage, I believe, the sign up. Uh, pick it up from there. Okay. Stanford, you don't have a question for us this month? You always manage to come up with something which sparks. A well, I don't, I don't have a, a question, but I did want to to bring back our um, our recurring episode of Stump the Chuck in, ah. in, in memory of our uh, of Chuck Doolittle. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody heard from him lately? Yeah, he's uh, back in Hannibal for a change. Okay, because he, he went out to South Carolina for a while. Yeah, he's working at the university down there. And so now he's working in Hannibal, remote. Oh, he's in Hannibal, working at the working in South Carolina. No, he's he's working for IBM on a Hansville project. And then it doesn't matter where IBM is; they're worldwide. Right. Yeah. Um. So the uh, the other day I was in a directory with a bunch of folders, and I wanted to know how much each space was taking up in the folders and so i i did a, a du s asterisk and it and 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 all the uh, roughly all the folders were roughly the same size except one of the folders was smaller than the rest and then and then i said well let's let's du s just that folder and, and then it was the same size as all the others and I scratched my head and scratched my head and said, why would you get a different result for the size of a folder when you DU it standalone versus when you DU it in, an, in a glob, in an asterisk? Hidden file? Not hidden. Lee, Lee put us on the right track this after the, or with his lecture. Was it a deleted file that was still in use? So it nope. wasn't show? No. Nope. Okay. It's hard links. Ah. When two directories are sharing a file and, and you can DU each directory separately and it'll say the directory is this big. And when you DU them both together, it says, well, the first one's this big. And the second one is only this much bigger. Ah. Uh. <laughs> so that means it's actually in the second one, but linked back to the first one? Well, it's hard to say which one it's actually in. You know, where, when it's an inode, right? Where is the, 
the inodes out there on disk someplace and a directory is just a bunch of english links to a to a hard inode but du walks inode and says i've already seen that inode i don't need to count it again uh, i was thinking inode was the answer but i couldn't mentally put together why that was until you just described it yes okay uh, i wish that ncdu would do that Every time I go and look for space hogs on my on my free NAS box, and you curse and and you curses or NCDU will walk all my links and count them all. I'm like, would you please not? I don't. I don't know what. I don't need to see my media media directory nine times because nine different jails have access to it. Yeah, so DU is DU, but NC is what? Uh, net, net commander or uh, what? N curses. Um, basically, it will go through and it will do a tree size of the of what's you consuming disk space. So a free NAS is that a vendor or is it free NAS is a ver is a it's an application bait of, of or the distro a free BSD that acts as a um, as a uh, NAS. Okay. So if you, this box right here, I don't know, can you guys see that? This guy right here has so got... You wouldn't get a command prompt? Yeah. And just use sure. DU, don't use NCDU. <laughs> Well, then I have to do. Then it's a pain in the rear end to go to dig into the directories to find out where the hogs are. Oh, I mean, in other words, there's not. You're right. I don't think du has a dash r switch, right, for recursion. For so, let me pull up my uh, terminal program. Yes, I I usually do it. I I I do a du at the top level. Figure figure out which folder is taking the most space, then CD to that folder, and then do another DU, and then figure out which subfolder is taking the most space, then CD to that folder, and um, and we, you just want to do it all in one command. I can remember my password. So it's, you know, this is... I, here's what you can do. You won't like this answer, but if you do a find, if you, if you, if you um, say DU minus S K whatever space dollar left paren find command close right paren you know go find all the files. yeah it, it, it'll it'll spit out like this but if I do ncdu I can now walk the directory so this is doing root so let me see ncdu to NCDU slash builds a hierarchy. It'll scan for everything that's on the disk. See, right now I can see that there's a whole bunch of files sitting in a recycle bin that I need to go purge out. Yeah, I mean, it depends and, on how you want it to behave, but you're right. If it's gonna, if it's gonna put it in a, like I said, usually I like that feature because when you're trying to do our snapshots, you're saying how much does this, how much does you know, um, du dash s daily zero, and then du dash s daily one, and they're the same size. But if you say du dash s daily um, bracket zero one bracket, it's like, well, daily zero is this big, and daily one is only this much bigger. You know, so you just have to know how du behaves and what you want to use it for. But if you're yeah, ncdu, it's like, no, I'm you since you since I have to build a hierarchical tree, where should I count the disk space? I, I'll just count it twice. So here's another here's another command I'm posting in the chat window. If you have a du and you want to add up all the columns in the left hand columns, you know, let's, anybody, however you if you have a column of numbers, whether it's the output of du or the output of ls or the output of word count or the output of something else, you can you can use um, the good old fashioned desk calc dc to add up a column of numbers. This is what it spits. It, normally, I would, I would, be in here and looking at the 
recording. The problem is, is the reporting only goes down to the partitions. So here's my primary ZFS storage. It's using, I'm using 4.64 terabytes. I got 8.62. And I'll go down here and say, okay, here's the beehive containers. Here's my anime share. Here's the Docker. But beyond that, I'm, I don't see anything. So right now it's going through and it's just digging through. I bit use this to go find those nagging little shares where, or some old job where I dig it. I just dumped data onto the server and it's like, why do I have this around? I don't need nine copies of the Windows directory. Oh, you need one. And yes, we've all been there. <laughs> I got a question for you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of a flex, but it's, um, but, um, I decided to splurge on myself. Mm -hmm. And well, can you see this? But, so uh, I, bit, a I found a, our micro center has not the last time I checked the 5900X Ryzen processors in stock. So I'm building my next generation of workstation this time. It's going to be completely Linux. Well, I'll take Windows and shove it into a VM in the background, but no more following me around the internet, Mr. Gates. <laughs> so it's going to be an interesting um, journey. According to Proton, I can get about at least 90 to 95% of my games working on it. Plus, you know, having a 12 core CPU and 64 gig of memory doesn't hurt. Nice. Probably ought to so, work out. I'll let you guys know next week if I have blown it up or not. Oh, okay. Dare I ask what that puppy cost? Uh, I got the AMD processor at MSRP of $550. The Tachi motherboard, which I'm running mm -hmm. for Maus Rocks, was... Basically 300. There's a PCIe 4 um, NVMe drive sitting under. That was another 300. And 64 gig of memory was like 350. So I'm sitting around $1,500. That's not bad. Especially for how much memory I shoved into this thing. Yeah. The fun thing is, is I got to decide if I'm keeping the unicorn bar for not. The who? The unicorn barf. All the RGB that's on these boards these days. Unicorn I think Everybody I'm wants... to understand that. Um, if you look at most modern computers, they're all lit up like a showpiece because everybody says, if I'm spending this much money, I'm going to make it look nice. Yeah. yeah. So all the computer parts, including the memory, the, the motherboards and all that stuff come with RGB lights on them. <laughs> really? Locally known, <clears throat> colloquially known as unicorn barf. Okay. Bling. I didn't realize that <laughs> it's been a while since I bought those parts. So, Okay. I could have spent like 20 or $30 less and got them my memory from Newegg, but I figured I should spend money at um, Micro Center and keep, and keep the money locally. Because right. it's nice being able to walk down and say, it broke. Give me a new one. Uh, will they? Uh, that, since I... Um, Uh, I've, yeah, I've since I paid for it, that, as I, long I, as I didn't like run it over or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
I mean, I don't think they're doing it just because they remember me, but yeah, every time I've gone in with something and said, okay, this stopped working, they say, you want to grab one off the shelf? Take it. Yeah, they're hard to beat. Okay, I haven't really bought much from them. So this is what it, the NC Curses does. So if I dig in here, I can see that Doctor Who's eating up 335 gig of the disk space, and it's mostly season two. Because it's all these giant TS files that I haven't reprocessed down into a smaller MKV file. Which is, you know, something I've been going through because I'm moving to... Um, Last year, I spent 300 bucks on a Dell 7560X. It was something I was going through Diddy, and my brother let me know it was there. And at the same time, there, there was a whole bunch of um, one terabyte SSDs coming through. And I'm like, can I move to Flash for like my normal stuff? Get off spinning disks for everything but my archives? Well, I'll tell you what, we all this is this is a great topic. Maybe we can pick it up and show the chat about it a little bit more next week. And in the meantime, I think we probably should head on to our main presentation of the evening. Yeah. So great. Thank you, Tyler. And for our main presentation of the evening, we have uh, uh, Steve Gomez. He's been a long time member of our group. And uh, He's going to talk to us tonight about uh, Red Hat Kickstarter. With that, I'll turn it over to Steve. All right, then. Oops. Don't click leave when you're aiming for share. Whoop. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, in a perfect world, you see... A presentation. Ta -da. We see uh, it. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, kind of a disclaimer at the beginning. I'm, we're calling it Red Hat, but it applies mostly equally to CentOS and Fedora. Um, I did do some looking around at some of the other distributions, and it seems to be um, fairly unique with the... Uh, you know, the Red Hat branch. Um, I didn't see where anybody else had one that was quite the same, but anyway, we shall continue on. Um, there is a lot of documentation. I gave a URL there. And um, the way CentOS and Red Hat are kind of together when you, a lot of times they share stuff. Actually, I think CentOS usually shares the Red Hat documentation. And um, in fact, that link that is there, I think if you click a couple of times, you're actually on Red Hat's site. Um, but they even say right there that this, um, the documentation from that link above came from Red Hat and you can get it at that other link. So there's quite a bit of documentation. Uh, if you get really lost, which is easy to do, um, you can spend many hours figuring out how to fix it. In fact, I did fix one problem um, <clears throat> that I was having last night. I fixed it lunchtime today. And uh, it was actually kind of neat. Found a, a human error on my part, if you can imagine that, that made a lot of things that I want to demo break. So anyway, what are kickstart installations? Uh, from the documentation on the previous slide, it, uh, Kickstart provides a way to automate the CentOS installation process, either partially or fully, and they're based, based surprisingly enough, on Kickstart files. And they're also, uh, you know, the in this day and age, there are containers and there are Kickstart and there's virtual machines. 
Um, and kickstart and containers work towards configuration or infrastructure as code, albeit pretty different. Um, kickstart works well if you're dealing with individual systems, you know, physical or virtual. Um, they, the containers like Docker or Podman, they do a better job for a virtual infrastructure. Um, and they can give you a lot of, uh, save you a lot of overhead because the way the containers work, um, you guys probably know they're actually just uh, processes on a single server that has the, the ability to serve those containers. Um, whereas with the Kickstart, you're talking about separate, separate systems, I guess, of the, at least in the way I've always dealt with them. And I don't think they really apply to containers anyway. Uh, so, how can you make your first Kickstart file? You can cheat. Um, if you've done any installation at all with uh, CentOS, um, you've probably done it, but may not have known it. And as soon as I find my... Uh, I have too many windows down here. Not that one. Okay, we'll do it this way. That's not either. That's the one I was after. Yeah, so um, if you have done, you probably have done something similar to this, may not have been on uh, CentOS or Red Hat, um, but you let the thing boot up to a certain point here. And you get to the installation program and you go through some dialogues and you answer about a gazillion questions. We're almost there, starting the installer. So I'm gonna do an example here, like if, you know, we all speak English, so we'll leave that alone. Um, and then you get this dialogue here, you can get in here real quick and enter a root password. Say you're good. And in CentOS 8, they allow you to, uh, new thing, you can make a, just a regular user. We'll make one called developer. Give them a password. Do a real quick network setup. And once you have the network set up, you can say that you actually are in here. So we get the right time zone. And I'm booting off of a local CD or what it sees it as local. It's actually a, uh, and I'm gonna do something fairly straightforward here. I don't wanna get a whole lot. We'll just add development tool. So if we wanted to compile some code or something of that nature.
Okay, and so now we could start an installation. And with all those manual steps that I did, <clears throat> we'll take this off and we'll do like Rachel Ray does and pull this over here. Because we have another bun that we can take out of the oven that I already went through all that with. <laughs> so you're putting that in the fake oven with the secret back door? Yes. <laughs> and if we come over here, I'm going to log in as root. And when I was talking about cheating, um, oops. Yeah, talking about cheating, I must have clicked on something inadvertently. Um, if you've used the GUI install configuration to build a system, you've also created a Kickstart file. So I just walked through a quick little, uh, throw together some clicking around to make an install. And I did almost the identical thing on this one. Mm -hmm. And you can see kind of hiding behind this virtual console. It's saying it made one called Rody and Root. And so there it is. It builds that. It remembers all those options that I picked when I was going through all of that. Um, and it puts it in this file, which we can take a quick look at. Does that include the password? It does. Encrypted even, kind of like this. Um, so this is, once you kind of get used to reading them, they're kind of sort of, um, you can kind of figure out what they're doing. I mean, here, network, start at the top. Uh, it seems to say Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, even if though it was uh, CentOS. And we use the graphical installer. And this is where on the virtual uh, CD-ROM that it was looking at, <clears throat> the packages that I installed. Um, keep the list short so it doesn't take too long. Installing from the CD. That first boot, I'm a little unclear on that. But then, you know, the other stuff is... Um, the root password, the developer password encrypted. So if somebody hijacks your kickstart file, they don't uh, know any secrets that you didn't want them to. Um, so that's kind of the way it works. <clears throat> and um, so if you wanted to make another system, very much to these other two that we have going here, the one that's in the oven cooking and the one that, uh, from this kickstart file that uh, we just looked at, that anaconda cs.cfg. Um, let's see. <clears throat> if we just happen to load that into an editor and do something simple like this, change the network, the host name from kick01 to kick02. Uh, actually, I want to change that to kick03, which I'm going to do. Slightly different than what we see here. Because <clears throat> two is what's in the oven cooking. Let me find my other window here. <clears throat> yeah, so kind of what I'm working towards here is with very minor changes. Oh, I see when I click on that, it wants to go forward. <clears throat> I'll quit clicking on that. Yeah, and there's a web server that I'll talk to in more detail here. We'll give it a host name of, oops. Ah. Mm -hmm. 
So two is in the oven. What one are you logged into right now? Uh, this is none of the above. This is a web server that uh, will, I'll explain how that comes into the mix. Actually, it really doesn't matter about that, the host Steve, name. Steve, are you sure that changed to three? It did not because um, it was saying it was read only, but it doesn't really matter for this demo. Um, because I don't really care if the, it's going to give it a unique address because it's DHCP and it's got a unique um, MAC address. Um, so anyway, it would be kick 01, but now it's going to be kick 02. So how do you use that? Notice I've got it on a web server. There are multiple <coughs> methods are supported. And you have to kind of like interrupt this normal boot, pra boot process. And uh, my preference is to use HTTP just because I've done it a bunch of times. And uh, get my VM back up here. Too many windows. Oh, that one. Okay, so this is an area I'm not real an expert on. Uh, Lee probably knows the uh, boot process much better than me, especially after what he was talking about with the uh, his uh, antics with uh, his backup systems and all that kind of stuff. But I know on the virtual machines, you can set them, at least with VMware, to use BIOS or the EFI. And I was not able to get them to, to interrupt the boot process with the escape at the right point. Um, but if you set it to BIOS, then it works kind of like I expected it to. So I'm going to start up number three here. And drag them over here. And when you get to this screen, what I'm saying is you press the escape key once you have it in focus. And in this box here, you're at the boot prompt. You type what is hidden behind my window here. And I'm doing all this to kind of demonstrate once you build one and you take that kickstart file and bring it over here and put it on the web server, um, then you can basically you're telling Linux to use kickstart. And here's the file that tells it what to do, which we just got from the other one. So away we go. Unless I type something wrong in that. We'll come up here and then we'll, we'll go, it'll automatically walk through um, basically the graphical install. I may have to tell it to reclaim the disk space because I walked through this a couple of times getting ready. Okay, so it's got, it says they're setting up base repository. I wish you didn't say that. I may have to cheat, but uh, it says here that we have the root password and the user has was created. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it doesn't like that. We can look at this. Mm -hmm. 
I think problem lies over here. I may not have told it to uh, Well, it does have the ISO file there, connected that power on. Oh, I know it's wrong. I had it connected to a boot disk, not an install disk. So it doesn't really have all the packages it needs, only has the package what it needs to boot. So if we do that, I just switched it to a different drive off screen here. So we'll go out of there. Yeah, okay. Or I can reboot over here. And it's not wanting to boot. Well, <clears throat> well, that's embarrassing. If you go back and change the ISO, would that make it work? That's what I thought I did. <clears throat> I noticed you typed in colon slash slash instead of slash slash colon. Oh, for the uh, at the uh, boot prompt? Yeah. Ah, okay. That counts as a user error. That would be uh, not so good. I'm going to power it down. Start from scratch. Okay, so it's reconfigured. Power on. Come on, baby. Okay, now we're booting up. That better? Okay, well, that's well, that's cooking there. I'll come over here and talk about this. So we, uh, so we've got it booting um, at that point there. Another option uh, we can, while it's doing this, oh, wait, I think it's, it's almost there. 
they do have an online configurator, which is um, kind of sort of useful. We'll get that ready here. Okay, this time I think you're right. I didn't didn't catch that I had a uh, typo in my entry there. And like I mentioned, I would was thinking I'd have to change this because it sees this drive as having been written to previously because I've been around the block a few times. So I'm gonna tell it to just go ahead and uh, reclaim all that space. But you'll notice that it did all these other steps without interaction. And so it had it been you know a real new hard drive, I wouldn't have had to do that either. And it would have just gone off and done all of this. And I wouldn't even have had to tell it to go, to uh, continue there. So, so it, it would, would bypass that screen entirely if it if it was accurate. I believe that is correct. It would go through all that, and it'll say, "I like all this stuff." Um, and that goes right here. Yeah, I might have had to click the continue, but I want to say I think it will just go ahead and go. And so after a while, it'll come up and say that. Uh, um, You know, it's ready to reboot like you know, this button down here. So, okay, move him off to the side and get my next exciting show ready. So back on the slide, what was the actual, um, when you skate to the boot, you typed Linux KS equals? Yes. Do, 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 do. And then what? What, what did the URL end up being? What does that look like? That was the, uh, let me grab the web server. I mean, it's just, so it's just, H, it, it, nothing special, just HTTP colon two slashes. And yeah, other than it's a host bar. name slash path to config file. Correct. And it's, we'll talk about that a little here when I get further down, start talking about the web server, but it's, I'm using Apache. So it's, you make a directory on, you know. Yeah, it goes in, it goes in bar lib, dub, 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 HTML, something. Right. And I stuck a directory called KS and the, the name of the, uh, it's followed by the name of the kickstart that I'm using there. Okay. So, yeah. Now I was going to talk about that more down the road. That's how you hijack into the boot process and Red Hat's online tool. Now, one caveat, you have to have an account with Red Hat, which I just happen to have one. And you can make one for free if you want to do that. Um, Redhead.com, labs. You know, the question was, will it just take off and run? And I hope that you have to click continue to start because it's really like, okay, kick start here, but I want to tweak a few things before you get started. Yeah, I, um, we can do another, uh, I made plenty of kick uh, VMs so we can play around with them. Uh, we'll talk about this here. This is the online configurator, the kickstart generator. And um, the questions that you answer here look a lot like the installation program, which is no big surprise. Like you can tell it that you're in, uh, uh, we want America, Chicago, put in your root password. Um, I'm not gonna go through all that because I actually saved one. Put another button in the oven, so to speak. That you, this is where you would type that URL, which in my case, is this 144 kickstart directory. And then I think I called one red hat kickstart, something like that. And the, you can do your partitioning stuff here, automate it. Um, so it's gonna build a CFG file? Yes. Why does the CFG file need to know the path that it lives at? Because um, right now it's on the Red Hat server and it doesn't know that I'm going to put it 
location of the installation tree. It's like, what, what? no, you you are the kickstart file. Don't worry, don't worry about where to locate. I mean, for the location of the installation tree, you don't mean that CFG, right? You mean where is the CD-ROM mounted? Right. The so um, there, those are two different things. Now the there. So this is for not the ones the, that I've done so far. It's a file. full. This is the repos. Yeah, well, for the ones that I've done so far, it, it's booting from a full um, install disk. Um, I was going to do one here in a little bit where I just boot off of a boot drive, and you can tell it to um, yeah, I think what I'm yeah. saying is you don't pop the location of the installation tree is not the CFG file, it's the path to get to the repos yes which in this case is a cd-rom this is where the boot program finds this instruction file in this case called kickstart.cfg okay. um let's look at this file again here you'll notice it said um do 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 use installation media cd-rom kind of right there in the middle just to the right of my mouse cursor there. So in this case, it's looking at the virtual CD-ROM saying, oh, okay, I'm gonna boot off, you want me to boot off of this one? And that's not just, well, not just the boot, but that's where it's installing from. I don't think I see your mouse cursor. What's the line, what's the, how are we, it, it, oh, there it is. First, yeah. what, CD-ROM or first boot? Uh, CD-ROM. CD-ROM, okay. Yeah, so, and there are two different things. We'll come, we'll revisit that again. Um, so we can do, do, go through all this stuff. And if you click on, come down to the bottom, you know, pick your options. Similar, the questions that you answer here are very similar to the install um, stuff. And then you come down here to the, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, tell it to download it. And it'll, uh, you can put it wherever you want it. I'm going to cancel that one because I just happen to have one that I did before. And this may be helpful. Yeah, in fact, this will be bring my editor back over here. This is the one that I baked up earlier. And you'll notice that on this one, oops. If you search for the word CD-ROM, it does not appear anywhere in there, but it does have a URL here um, that you may recognize from this 10.1.144 happens to be on the same web server. Uh, so what you what this allows us to do, um, come back over here, move this guy out of the way. is you can use a minimal boot ISO. And because a lot of full installation ISOs have grown massively in size, it's pretty impractical and wasteful to, to copy that full image to a DVD. Sometimes, I don't even know if it's possible. For example, the, the one we're using here for CentOS 8, let's see, drag this guy back over here. is what's that like nine and a quarter gig so when you're setting something up that a number of users are going to be using um it's a lot handier to say well here's a you know a minimal cd or better yet a usb so that you know boot off this usb drive and then get back to that boot window we were looking at a while ago so question uh sure that URL, that could be anywhere on the internet, to the web page? Um, for, we'll come back and visit that okay. as well. Okay. Um, because I did have a problem, technical issue, I'll say, that was based on uh, 
when I start talking about the web server to support all this, I'll talk about that a little more. Um, short answer is you can get it. There, I mean, there's a you know gazillion mirror sites out there as well um, that I almost had to use for this demo, but was able to get mine working. Yeah. I so when you're using Kickstart, yes, you only can. you only need a sing, only need a single copy of the full installation image on your network. And for convenience and speed, and um, I started doing this stuff at work to where if it wasn't on the corporate network, you weren't going to be able to reach it anyway. So um, in some cases, you kind of have to have it inside the firewalls and gateways and proxies and so on and so forth. Because um, your IS people who are in another country won't let you get to it. And so um, when I use that Red Hat Kickstart um, or their configurator, their online configurator, I purposely made it such that it would look at, uh, when I typed in the address there, I intent intended to boot that one off of um, just a minimal disk. So I'm gonna grab another VM here. I made a bunch of them so I wouldn't run out. And make sure I have it set up right. Yeah, I'll let you guys watch me click around here. Basically, I'm just connecting the virtual drive to this CentOS 8 20.11 um, boot ISO. And you probably want to have your boot ISO and your installation image match. Um, I've always done that just in case, but uh, you notice I've got this CentOS 1911 um, install CD. Probably not a good idea to mix and match. So I made sure that I have the boot ISO that matches the installation ISO as well. So now the virtual machine is connected to that. Now it is. What else do I need to do here? This one may not have started yet. All right. Number four, power him on. Open a console right before your eyes. Yeah, and while it's hopefully booting here, ah, this will not work. You'll notice that in that um, in that configurator, I put the line that looks a lot like this one to where I'm telling it to point to a directory back on that same web server that's called CentOS 8. Um, and I make, need to make one change here. So bear with me a little bit more. I forgot the thing I was saying about the... Uh, BIOS boot, you know, I was looking right at it about 10 seconds ago. Save that. <clears throat> okay. Equals. HTTP call slash rest 10.1.1.1144 KS. And the name of this one is
rh kickstart.cfg. And if we go back to this, I'm gonna open that up. Yeah, you know, like I was saying before, this one doesn't say anything about a CD, but on this line right here, it's installing from that URL. So move him out of the way. Start this guy up. And depending how lucky I am, we should have another one cooking here. So in this scenario, yeah, you could have walked up to people that are trying to build up a VM or a you know, a physical workstation, um, which we actually are planning on doing that for our, some of our guys over in operations to where we have a Kickstarter file and perhaps an additional script. There it went, okay. Did not click continue and away it went. So a question we had before. Um, I wonder if there's an item you can put in the CFG file that says, you know, prompt or no prompt? Probably so, or you can always. They have a man page? Uh, through their, uh, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of web pages, you know, that uh, talk about that. You know, some of those I referenced before, but while that's building, I'll see what we have going on here. Okay. While that's in the oven, I'll talk about the Kickstart server. Um, they, this URL here at the top, that's, they talk about how to make it. And you, like I mentioned before, you can use a NFS. Um, you can carry a USB hard drive around with you, uh, so on and so forth. I found the HTTP, you know, based on a web server to be kind of the easiest way, then all you need is uh, something with the boot image on it and remember where to find the kickstart file, which I've been demonstrating here. And so HTTP, that's Apache. And um, once you have a server that already has that installed and has room for you know, that massive nine gigabytes of the uh, uh, install image, you create a directory there called, uh, you know, this is uh, back to Stanford's question earlier, you know, var www.html is Apache's default home point, what well, they call it, the, the, the root drive or something, or web root, I think it is, in the Apache configuration. And I just made a directory called KS for kickstarts, and then you load your des desired ISO onto the web server. Then you mount it using this big honking command here. And CentOS 8 actually belongs right here. <laughs> and, you know, whatever the path and so on of the ISO is, mount it. <clears throat> yeah, you mount it as CentOS 8. So that when you do this command, CP minus R recursive, it copies this whole path here. And it sticks the CentOS 8 at the tail end of this to create that directory that we were looking for. And that is very important because the way I was doing it before, I mentioned having problems. And in that directory, I thought I was gonna have to commit suicide because I wouldn't, none of this stuff would work, <laughs> which I didn't. You don't have to CP dash R it. I mean, if you've got the dot ISO, you can just mount it at mount CD ISO and then make a symbolic link in var dub HTML KS to mount CentOS 8. Okay, yes, that's, that would work as well. Um, oops. 
Yeah, there just has to be a CentOS 8 directory that's walkable, whether it's a real live directory or a mounted ISO directory. <laughs> yes. But the thing that got me was this. If you look here, yeah, here's the, I'm here at Ap Apache's home place. And there's some directories. Before I just, I was just copying. I didn't make mount CentOS 8. I just made mount and then copied the contents of that into the, you know, var www.html CentOS 8 over here. And that did not include that tree info or the dot disk info, which meant that it, couldn't figure out what that was. I was trying to do this um, boot from the um, you know, web hosted install image. And it said, I don't know how to do that. Which is a little scary because I was kind of wanting to have this done. Um, and that's also why if we look at this. What's he called? Ah. RH. Come on, fingers. Uh, the question was asked, I think, uh, by Stan. Actually, this line here. Like, here's the URL that I wanted to work. And um, it wasn't behaving. So I managed to figure out how to make it do a similar thing, but getting it from the mobac.edu repository. Um, well, you have a typo there. I mean, in, in the HTML, go back to the previous screen, your eight, the, the, the contents of your dar, var dub HTML directory. This one? No, no the, the terminal that shows me the contents of, the, of that directory. Like the black window, yeah, the, not not the contents of the config file, but the you were you just a minute ago you ls the contents of the var dub html. Like so? Nope, you're right. CentOS, I was thinking that CentOS 8 was inside of KS. Nope, you're right. It that should work. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't know why you couldn't find it with the with the with your with your IP address slash CentOS eight. Should I mean point? Take a browser and point it at at IP address CentOS eight and see what you get. <laughs> oh yeah, um, right. In fact, I did that um, with those little dots at the end. Is that uh, SC? Security enhanced Linux, or, or is it App Armor, or what is that? Talk about these little dots right after the X. That's I think a, that is SE Linux, Stan. Okay. Maybe SE Linux bit you. Well, what I, one thing that I noticed, um, I don't think it was, although that's, uh, was it LS uh, space dash Z? It shows the, because one thing that I had noticed was that here, oops, I need to do LS minus AL, sorry. Mm. Like I mentioned a few moments ago, that dot tree info and the dot disk info, with oh. the way I copied it, did that copying stuff before, those were not there. And today around lunchtime, I went, had a chance to look for some, uh, um, You know, just troubleshooting, did some web searching and found a uh, tutorial in one of the CentOS docs where they said, do not, if you copy things in such a way that those two dot files are not there, dot tree info and dot disk info, it ain't going to work. And I had noticed, you know, just like I did here with LS minus AL, they weren't there before because I was comparing that to what was on the CD and, um, 
then when they said, well, it, it won't work without those files, it apparently gives it the information it needs to, uh, you know, right, parse right. the directory right. you tree. Were, you were saying that. Yes, you were. Yeah. And so when I redid it with these commands, bada bing, bada boom, it worked. <laughs> And then you can unmount the CD when you're finished and that gives you the web server. And you now have a web server that allows access to your kickstart files here at that directory. And in fact, um, something that Stanford was pointing out if I did what he suggested. Yeah, like there's the sent to West one. The dot files, oddly enough, are not shown there on the web yeah. browser. Um, and if we do this, I don't know look, how you get a browser to show hidden files. <laughs> yeah, that was a, we'll save that for a talk for another day. We'll let Lee do that one. <laughs> but here's the, the stuff that I have in the Kickstarter directory. And we just saw the uh, sent to West directory. So, Again, that just kind of points to putting these files and this directory tree for CentOS in a place where Apache can say, you want me to divvy it up? All right, here it comes. And uh, so, and I was doing this, I was looking at the CentOS 8 as uh, Stanford suggested. I thought, well, shoot, the files are there. What in the world is going on? And um you know, from this view, don't see that the dot tree info is missing. Um, right. But anyway, should you ever do this, watch out for that tree. George of the jungle. <laughs> I was wondering if somebody would catch that one. <laughs> Makes me proud. Okay. What else do I have here? Uh, Kickstart reference. There's all this. This is the uh, URL for where they talk about the file format reference. And I'll kind of run through that a little bit here. It's, it takes a little getting used to. And um, if you want to make a career out of doing these things, you probably want to look at some examples and test run some things, you know, make a, um, and install using the, uh, you know, just use the, regular GUI install interface there to, you know, get a package. Okay, I want it to be like this and then see what the kickstart file says. And I think this is a typo right there. That should probably be a percentage sign. Um, but there's a command section, a sections section, and then there are section types, add on sections where you can, you know, add on different things. Um, I don't have any examples for that. And the, the most important part, at least, or one of the important parts is the uh, package selection sections starts with percent packages. And then you list your uh, um, desired packages in there. For example, I've got one from a ways back. Okay, there it is. Got a pretty long list of stuff I was wanting to install there. And it actually worked as intended on CentOS 7, uh, which we'll come back to visit that again, that note. So you have your packages, you put them in there. Um, they do talk about, you know, it's percent packages. Um, you can comment with a hash. The commands typically come first. They're the things like uh, setting the time zone. Um, some of the network configuration stuff, I believe when you talk about commands, it's basically this stuff up here at the top. You know, keyboard layout, a lot of those things we saw, how you set up the network, et cetera, et cetera. 
move him out of the way. Yeah, and you could have, yeah, the command section isn't really marked as a section, it's just the commands. Um, other sections, you can have them more than once and they can intermix with uh, other sections. And when it's ready to read, for example, all the uh, packages, it'll read them in the order. Even if you have like four different sections that have packages, it'll read them that in the order that they're listed in the file. And, you know, it doesn't seem to, it can be interleaved with other sections. And missing required items will result in the installer pausing for user input, like we saw before when the, uh, for example, when the hard drive had already had data written to it. Um, there are, if you look in the Kickstart configurator things, you can tell it to, you know, just reclaim the whole hard drive so that if you are like reprogramming a system, um, it'll you don't have to stop for that step. I would imagine just by commenting out one of the required items that it would cause that pausing. And then you would put it in, say, for example, you comment out the, the section where you put in the root password and then it would pause there. So you would have to put in the root password. Yeah, there's probably more ways to cheat that. Yeah. Um, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally. And yeah, okay, packages marks the beginning of a package list. End marks the end of the package list. Um, ampersand with the, the carrot, you know, and specifies an entire environment. Um, for example, the an infrastructure server is an environment in their nomenclature. So ampersand, carrot, infrastructure server will load that entire thing then they have a similar thing for groups but you just don't put the carrot just the ampersand specifies a group to install like the x window system or the desktop group um, again and just kind of ends it and you can specify individual packages by name like sqlite curl um, or specify wildcards like docbook everything or Ming 32 everything. Um, so it's pretty handy in that respect. And put those all in your packages section and you'll get them. Now, if you have an inst as far as what modules are available, you can run on a system that is up and running, you can run yum module list to see what modules there are. Um, yeah, then you can exclude packages with just a minus before a package name or you know, for an individual package or minus ampersand excludes packages or groups. And you probably need to put the carrot in there for the um, environments. Although they, I don't think they mentioned that in this maybe the environments have to be installed. You have to request them, they're not installed by default. Whereas some packages and groups are just installed by default, whether you ask for them or not, unless you exclude them intentionally with a minus sign or a minus ampersand. And things in the, 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 the packages line, percent packages line has a long list of op options that you can put in. Um, like multi-lib, that's for if you want, if you're on a 64-bit machine, but you also wanted to include some 32-bit libraries um, for like a cross-compiler. It's a reasonable reason for that. Or ignore missing items. You know, if you, if there's something in your package list that doesn't really exist in the source distro that you're installing from, it'll it might just say, well, I can't find it, but I'm gonna go on because you told me to. Um, and by the way, these are double minus signs, not dashes. It didn't wanna behave with uh, doing a double dash. It wanted to 
wordsmith it for me. So the the options on the packages lines are double minuses. The exclude this is a single minus. Correct. Yeah, like these are kind of like for the packages, it's like a command line, you know, like minus minus version for most programs. No, that makes sense. And I can actually yeah. see that the double minuses are twice as wide as the single minus. Right. Some white space would be helpful, but thank you, Mr. Fine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess this seems, you know, minus package name seems kind of intuitive since you're like subtracting it from the list. So the minus sign kind of makes sense in that respect. Um, they even have a handy dandy online converter to go from CentOS 7 to CentOS 8. Um, in fact, I actually on that one that I had open there, if I can find the correct web browser. Well, it's probably just easier to do it. So if you go to and find out the typo in what I just typed in. Ta -da. So you get this Kickstart converter. Uh, please select your installation method, HTTP, and you can put in the address where you want. Um, then you can browse for one and literally it'll come up there. And then, in fact, I think I will do that because it shows you, it's kind of nice what it does here. Then upload one. And it's one of these, ignore that one, start to convert. Goes pretty quick, even shows you what it changed. Now this was the intent was to convert it from this script that I uploaded, um, was used on Red Hat 7, CentOS 7, and it, alleges to convert it to CentOS Red Hat 8. And earlier I did download this file and tried to boot off of it and it didn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> they get you closer. Um, I did not have time to debug what was really wrong with it, but uh, if it only worked. So I, like I said, I tried a conversion to a C configuration file. And as of now, it complains about the software packages. Apparently there is something in the packages list. Um, How did you get the CentOS 7 uploaded to the converter? Uh, you click on that little button there. Cause you're just uploading the um, no, kickstart converter. Yeah, there's this upload a file button here. Oh, okay. And you just, and then you browse to a file on your desktop and it pushes it out through your browser. Okay. Correct. To redhat.com there. And it did the conversion, made these changes. And that this, you will recognize, ooh, sent to West 9. Well, that's the one I just typed. So that one wouldn't have worked. My speed typing got in the way there. Let me uh, 
look real quick at this guy. Hmm. Wonder if I messed it up twice. No, nope, first time. Yeah, this is the one that I did earlier. Um, it was sitting in the oven baking. <laughs> It didn't work, but I, I did put in the correct URL before, um, but it still didn't work. So, and I think that might be everything I know about Kickstart files. Yes, that is all. <laughs> so we can look over here. Some of these other ones finished up. Like this guy, there was a minimal install. Let's see. He's finished baking. And I think we said to install Apache on this. Is that correct? Maybe not. Probably needs to be configured, but that's a story for another day. Um, but on his host file or kickstart file, Yeah, okay. Minimal environment, web server, which I may have incorrectly assumed is Apache. I would imagine it is. So, but it made another kickstart file based on its own install. As you can see here, it's got the uh, Yeah, the URL, I see down below a little bit here, pointing to my web server as expected. Any questions? How long have you been using Kickstart? Um, on and off for couple three years kind of as the need arises i had you know different things i was making virtual machines for um engineering test infrastructure where i could have some vms um up and running with uh, you know just a generic compiler you know gcc g plus plus and um different unit test things um, so I wanted to build kind of a, a group of them. I think I made like four of them at one time. Yeah, so we could have four different tests going simultaneously. I orchestrate that stuff using Team City for the, which is kind of a licensed Jenkins, but actually quite powerful. And has it been growing organically in those three years or is it pretty much stayed structurally effectively the same over that time the infrastructure i mentioned uh, yeah the well the way kickstarts put together um i know we just saw an instance where you know from version seven to version eight they changed some things um i my hunch is that they change package names and offerings, you know, as time marches on. Mm -hmm. um, they have removed, if you go reading through some of the details of the, you know, those web links that were included throughout here. Um, uh, 
Um, they remove features, which I kind of wish they didn't, because that makes it a little, uh, I guess they decided they didn't need them or weren't used. Yeah. But Kickstart itself, I think, is pretty mature. Um, so I think once you get used to using it, it kind of seems to be fairly stable, although you probably want to redo your scripts. Um, I redid that uh, CentOS 7 to CentOS 8 script in hopes of being able to use it without having to do too much experimentation with it. But as we saw, I need to kind of dig a little deeper. Um, But I guess a director, it seems pretty mature. Um, I don't think they want to discontinue it, you know, because it's in it's in Red Hat as well. Um, even though they're discontinuing <laughs> CentOS, which is well, technically uh, they're not discontinuing it; they're just changing it, and everybody hates the change. Right. Um, Yeah, the CentOS stream, I have done some, I was using that for a while thinking, well, okay, fine, I'll use that. But it's, it had so many changes coming so often that it was just, I mean, you, it was impractical to keep up with it. You know, every time I turned around, there was, you know, some update or some patch or, you know, you could never just reboot the machine without it saying, oh, I'm going to do this too. Um so yeah, for a, a, a build infrastructure that I wanted to be kind of stable. Yeah, I kind of abandoned my CentOS stream virtual machines and went back to regular CentOS. For, I use the CentOS for um, things that I expect to change quite a bit or you know, update but then I use Red Hat for things that I consider a real server. For example, the, you know, the Team City server, we have a, our own Git server, a couple of subversion servers. And I recently brought up a, uh, you know, a LAMP server because we have a need to find uh, you know, a database to find where all, all our documents are, which is an insane issue. But it's like, oh my God, we have no way to find them. Um, Yeah, so things that are a server that we just want to turn on and have it be there forever without really tinkering with it. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, uh, it's a Red Hat. I've got a license with them, or our department does. And it, that's worked out kind of well, or actually really well. Um, I have learned to use Unix fairly well. Um, so I could do most of this stuff without having to, you know, beg for the, you know, from the Red Hat support people, although they are quite responsive. Um, but I have called them up and, or actually I, we have email level support, but I have sent them emails and they'll call you back, uh, and talk you through whatever it is you're, you're working on. But when I was planning some updates to uh, the vSitter server where this, this infrastructure lives, there were some changes to the networking that I wanted to have. I called them and said, well, I want to, they added, the VMware added another layer to the network stack in, in their virtualization so that the, the names were not going to match what they were going to be. And so I had them give me a, uh, a recipe for how to do that, you know, without, uh, which basically was getting into Etsy, sysconfig, something or other, and changing the couple of files live down there, you know, related to the network. But they said, you should be able to do this, 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 and this, and they'll just work. And so I went through there and did this, 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 and this, and lo and behold, they just worked. So I probably could have dug around and figured it out, but these were things I wanted to well, there were the servers and when I turned it back on, I just really needed them to just work again without having to do, uh, you know, you know, chase down the problem on with Google search or whatever. 
So it works well. And plus whoever uh, comes up behind me, they've got support as well. Cause uh, I'm not ter- too terribly far from retirement. So. You said you Sounds like a process. Into- yeah. Go ahead. Centos and Red Hat, does it work for Dora too? Yes. Yes, I'm most certain I didn't. I uh, kind of wanted to get a chance to uh, try a Fedora flavor of it, but then I didn't, just didn't have time. Um, I actually, like right now, my desktop is Linux Mint 19, I think it is. I actually tried Fedora, yeah, Fedora 31, I want to say. I would have gone with that, except that. That version of Fedora didn't work with my network card, and I wasn't in the mood for tinkering with uh, drivers and all that kind of stuff. So I downloaded Mint, <laughs> threw it in there, and away I went. So I guess I've heard that Rocky Linux is kind of going to take the place of CentOS, something like that. I have heard the same thing. Um, I wonder if does Kickstart work with Rocky? I'm assuming yes, because they're basically, I think they're really? taking kind of like what they did with CentOS. They took the, the Red Hat logos off and uh, made I it say CentOS instead. Anaconda based, right? If, if your distro is Anaconda based, then Kickstart will probably work. Yes, and I think Rocky is going to be the same thing as CentOS, but they're going to call it Rocky instead of CentOS um, and be managed by different people. There's a open source group, as I understand that, you know, the Rocky group, they're um, going to self-maintain it because I believe CentOS is actually maintained by Red Hat currently. Um I don't, I, so what they have now is Fedora being the, you know, the very leading edge of the knife way out there. And then after a little bit of the dust settles, along comes CentOS Stream and takes another pass with a knife, maybe not quite as sharp as Fedora. And then right behind that comes Red Hat. So it's, uh, they've got two stages of, um, I guess, prototyping, if you want to call it that. And, you know, community testing in front of the Red Hat re- release itself. Uh, so, yeah, that's basically what it is, is yeah. community testing. Right. So on the inside, from the Red Hat perspective, I, you know, kind of makes sense to them. because like, hey, we get more testing instead of, you know, CentOS lagging behind. Um, you know, now they're pushing it forward. Anything else? Questions? I'm in no hurry. And, it seems uh, like this would work great with a Pixie boot to getting the ISO to start up on the system and then transferring over to the Kickstart. Um, yeah, if you read through the documentation, Pixie boot is an option. Um, like I mentioned, somewhere during the course of the night that they, it, it supports NFS and I think just about everything really. Now here's our pulling the buns out of the oven. This guy finished. I think this is a desktop Flavia kick two. This is the first one that was made from the configuration of this one, kick one. CentOS stream, that disturbed me that it says that. Maybe it's just the kernel version. So it's too bad that, it, that you have to escape to the boot line and then say Linux KS equals URL, rather than just saying 
a, a, hit escape and type KS. And then the KS would bring up a browser, a, a, a web browser where you could surf to where the CFG file is. Um, yeah, except I don't think the web browser is there yet. I guess they're, well, they're trying. Yes and no. Now you're in some kind of GUI, right? Right now. Yeah. What? Well, if, if they would just go as far as saying just type KS and have it give you the box that you type that URL into, that would be, that in itself would be kind of handy. Yeah, and, and, I'd, and I'd like to be <clears throat> able to type a URL that takes me to a folder and then scroll up and down and pick the CFG file that I want. That would be pretty cool. But I have not seen examples where that's <laughs> one of the options. <laughs> Where's the red hat suggestion box? Yeah. <laughs> For a while, I actually was on the red hat mailing list, but I got out because of, you just get quite a bit of uh, context or, you know, content. Um, and I got on it because when I first started tinkering with these kickstart files, I had been out on medical leave because I screwed up my left knee and had, had it sewn back together. Um, so I was off, off work and I sat down doing all these kickstart files would have been on CentOS seven and I had them working and then I would reboot the, do the first reboot, start the machine up and um, do an update, which typically seems like a good idea. However, what I was finding was that uh, in the meantime, while I was making all these awesome install scripts or kickstart scripts, I had to sneeze and then CentOS introduced a bug. Actually, it was a Red Hat bug because I was able to red, reproduce it on Red Hat bug to where you fiddle around with the system and the mouse will stop working. Like what in the world? Then I was able to reproduce that on, uh, on Red Hat as well. And the way I wound up fixing that, well, there was a patch, but the real fix was to uh, um, wait until they patched the kernel Somehow they introduce a kernel bug that broke the mouse, <laughs> of all things. And uh, yeah, so it kind of, in the end, it kind of went away. But uh, it was a real pain in the neck. So on this one, we probably installed. Yeah, so we've got that. I don't know if that, okay, that doesn't include CMake, but basically we got, we have that. Now this guy should, I'm gonna freak out if it doesn't show the exact same version. Eight point three point one, two thousand nineteen, eleven twenty one. 2019-11-21, okay. So one, oh, a GCC and G++. Oh. But, but whatever, it's the same version. And they're actually going to be from the same project. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Is this the one you thought you installed Apache on also? Um, the one that, yeah, that, no, that's the one over here that just disappeared. So I'm going to minimize this guy. <clears throat> oh, it's this one. I hate it when it rolls, Apache, unroll it. Just for your information, besides uh, Randy, or not Randy, Rocky Linux, there's a couple other projects for CentOS replacement. There's a Al Almal Linux and uh, 
Oracle Linux is trying to sell uh, it as a replacement and OpenSUSE Leap has some features. And I just recently heard that Ubuntu Server is a recommended replacement for CentOS, although it's a completely different world as far as yeah. RPMs and dev files and all that. Yeah, also work, I've been doing some work with, uh, starting some work on containers and uh, Ubuntu and Debian seem to be the better choice because you it, it's a little easier um, to get some of the oddball packages with some of the other distributions. So now um, you got that window shade pulled down. Is it just pgrep space HTTP? Probably not turned on. Yeah, is there a sys, sys CTL? What's that syntax? Well, it's um, type, uh, first of all, type which HTTP, HTTPD, and it should say user local SBIN or something. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, and then it's um, system CTL, it's way too many letters, um, start space HTTPD. <sighs> and now you can do the P grep, I think. All righty then. Uh, does, the, does the P grep command work now? Yeah, there they are. I mean, and then you just got to point something. I mean, there's nothing there. I mean, now you got to point a browser at it and it'll say, it'll say patchy working. <laughs> yeah, right. In fact, I was going to do that very thing just because you have to do that when you get a web server working. <clears throat> I mean, you didn't, you didn't also load a browser in this load, did you? You don't have Firefox or Conqueror or? No, but I've got a, I'm on my desktop, I'm starting one up. Input one point one twenty eight. Yeah, and there it is. Ta da There you go. Okay, yeah, so it, it made a web server. Um, I'd like to point out that we appreciate the errors as well as the situations where you don't have any errors because <laughs> so, we, as normal human beings, are going to make errors, and it's kind of nice to see somebody else fix it. Yeah, um, not a shame to admit I'm human. <laughs> It's a little, a little uh, stressful when you have a, you know, people watching, you know, over your shoulder. Like, but oh well, I knew something would go haywire somewhere. So, but it's kind of nice to see that that did work pretty. You know, this one works. We were able to get the web server up. Here it is. I mean, we're ten seconds away from making an HTML file that said hello or something, which. So. Yeah, so I've got now uh, to get all the buns out of the oven here. I think I got them all out. There's the web server. Here's a. Two would have been one of the dev servers with the compiler GCC. And here's the first one I made. What's this guy? There's one that's kind of like halfway in an install. Forgot what I was doing with him, but uh, so uh, once again, any questions? Well, thank you very much, Steve. My boss has been begging me to learn kickstart now i can report tomorrow that i have excellent <laughs> um on that note um i have this obviously i have this slideshow um i could easily send it to editor and we'll post it yeah I was gonna, you want it 
I was thinking you probably want it as a PDF. Yes. Yeah. Or you can send it as uh, whatever and I'll convert it. Yeah. Go ahead and do that right now. PDF form. Yeah, so, um, and also, yeah, this stuff is on a, a, all these sample files are on, as well as this presentation are out on GitHub, which it is. do this and that's not the right password but anyway what is the alphabet soup in front of the word kickstart Oh, G E S L L C, Gomez Engineering Services LLC. Thank you. <laughs> I just made it up on the fly, but that's the URL. And the fact that I had to put the unsuccessfully put the password in means I probably have that as a private repository. But if anybody has interest, um, email me here. And that can be changed. I can, I can flip that around. I believe it's just a matter of checking a box in there somewhere. So let's see, that thing should have get printed at my documents. I thought it did. Hmm. I don't know where it went. Because I don't see a red hat thing in here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so here it is as a PDF. In all its glory, so. Yeah, so to mail that to the editor, like editor at slug.org? Correct. Sure. Okay. I can and, do that. And we can post it up on the archives along with the recording that we'll get in a day or two or overnight, whatever. Okay. All righty then. Fantastic. Steve Gomez and I've, I neglected, I, I had intended to stick in a little bit more in your introduction. And I, uh, I'm going to go back and, and uh, uh, recap that now. Uh, Steve, in his other life, is a lead engineer for the Embedded Systems Development Team, where they make, uh, uh, combined with some other engineering disciplines, to develop microbiological analysis instruments. Uh, and he works for a company which formerly was a subsidiary of our good old home aircraft company, McDonnell Douglas. And uh, uh, the, the name of that company, do we, do we want that known or not known? Um, it is Biomary U. Okay. It's French owned. The, uh, it was uh, Vitex Systems when we were with McDonnell Douglas. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we were in the uh, what was known as the information systems group, which was a group of projects that uh, had people in it and they made things other than jets. <laughs> there was us doing uh we actually made a uh an antimicrobial system that was intended to go on the united states space station as a subcontracted through nasa or for nasa they approached uh, mcdonald douglas saying can you do this and so they um they did and so they had prototypes ready to go um, and it spent a whole bunch of money. We were in what was called the information systems group. We were in a, a couple of other companies doing some big database things. Um, one of them was for the post office and that contract didn't make it through. And the other contract was for, um, a national healthcare database, which is kind of the precursor of Obamacare or some of the early prototyping anyway we they were losing money hand over fist and we had made this uh, microbial system to where um it was ready to launch in space but we were waiting in line for a space flight that it could go on and uh in the meantime we commercialized it and we're just starting to break even and making a little bit of money selling these things to uh hospitals in the United States, as well as we started selling in Europe. Um, and then the information systems group was saying, you know, they were talking to, I guess it was John McDonald in those days, or maybe Sandy McDonald, that name comes in there. But he was saying, you know, your division is just losing money hand over fist. And uh, we were wondering what you're going to do. And so one year they broke even by selling Vitex systems to BMRU. Mm. And so that's how we got owned by a French company. I mean, it's worked out good because being owned by a French company made it really easy to get in the European marketplace because they're already there. Ah. And uh, so it, it did kind of accelerate our sales. And we did actually... Um, on the day that I started there, which was January 28th, I want to say, of 1985, they did have a test ready to run on the space shuttle. And uh, it was like the original prototype, which is very primitive looking compared to what we've done in 35 years since. But that was my first day on the job. And it did get loaded onto a space shuttle to get um, sent into space. But, but does if anybody recall, remember what happened in January of 85? Yes. <laughs> that happened on my first day on the job. <laughs> the January shuttle made 28. it. Yes. Yes, that shuttle is the one that blew up. And that when I was when that event happened, I was sitting in the uh HR office of uh McDonald Douglas, which now is the flight safety building, talking to some insurance ladies, and one of them came up and said, Did you hear the space shuttle blew up? It's like Nah, that never happens, but oh yeah, I was wrong on that. <laughs> so yes. I remember similar situation. I was sitting in there in a meeting with my boss and, and uh, one of the guys from my team came to the door and starts mouthing you know, the space shuttle something up. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, it was supposed to launch about now. Yeah, so the space shuttle went up. Thank you. He's like, no, no, it blew up. Blew up. <laughs> Just step in the step into the meeting. What are you trying to tell us? It blew up. And I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. So the, the 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 automated system, your lab machine that you're talking about here, um, uh, is that that the one that. Um, it, it did fly on a different shuttle flight, and it was with, and I don't remember his name, but uh, the, the guy from, from your division became the first commercial astronaut, if I recall. He was the first guy who wasn't a NASA astronaut to fly. Um, 
we did have a second one that, that I was going to uh, throw in the mix here. Um, because I did work a little bit on the prototype. You know, the space shuttle had, you know, these little bays, they called them, that were, you know, specific size, you know, specific dimensions, as well as very specific uh, power uh, specifications where you, you get this many volts and amps and so on and so forth for your box that has to fit in this little thing that would bolt in there. So it's, you know, for good reason, because you're going to launch that sucker into space. And I did some, a uh, little bit of cabling on that. And some of my colleagues worked on, they had to, we took a, what was called the Vitek Junior, which was something that we were selling to smaller hospitals. And they took that and scaled it down even further to where it would fit in one of those space shuttle cargo bays. And uh, one of the guys that I work with, he went on the Vomit Comet <laughs> with, <Yeah. laughs> and did some test running on that, which uh, that's the like a C-130 or something, some big cargo plane or whatever. I think it's actually a commercial jet where they just took all the seats out and you, they have tables strapped down and things like that. And they fly up really fast and then they get to the apogee and start going down again. And they go down at a rate that simulates you know, the speed at which you would be falling so that you sense zero gravity as well as whatever it is you're working on. Um, so I knew some of those people. I don't think any of them actually um, were on the shuttle, but that flight went up. It went into space. The tests were ran. And this was back in the days of floppy disks. So we were thinking, boy, and hard drive. There was a hard drive in it that had the test date on it. And we're thinking, boy, wait till this baby comes down. We're going to get our zero G test. However, that was the shuttle that had the missing tile under the wing. Oh, gosh. That started to reenter and fell apart. <clears throat> and so that we had two space tests. One of them, as far as we know, the tests were successful, but we'll never know. <laughs> wow. So. Well, if I ever win a free trip into space, the first thing I'm going to ask is, I'm going to say, Steve Gomez doesn't have any packages riding on this thing, does he? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was kind of a ironic story because the, you know, the Mary U family, which is where the Bio Mary U comes from, obviously French, but their, their great grandfather, you know, their history was, you know, they, their great grandfather worked hand in hand with Louis Pasteur, which, oh, you know, wow. that's how they want to be in a microbiology company. And so they were, you know, touting that as being like, this is what made us what we are. And we're all over here saying baloney. <laughs> NASA is what made us what we were. So, um, but they finally figured it out. You're like, okay, you guys did do this stuff. So, wow. But, you know, so I, it looks like I'll finish my career keeping my uh, both feet on firm ground. <laughs> so, well, anybody thinks of any more uh, follow up questions here talking about airplanes? I'll put in a quick thing that I could have said earlier with the calendar up uh, the commemorative Air Force, the CAF. Uh, oh, yes. Week they did announce that they are going to uh, send some uh, World War II era planes to Spirit of St. Louis Airport for the Memorial Day weekend. So they'll be there Saturday through Monday. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can see them sitting on the end of the runway out there, or they will be flying, uh, and you can actually buy a ride on them. It's not cheap, but... Uh, uh, you know, these planes aren't going to go last forever, so could be your last chance. Um, I haven't heard if there's going to be any sort of an orchestrated air show or if it'll just be you just see one when they take off or land. So, uh, and that's uh, the Memorial Day weekend, Saturday through Monday. Uh, and, and Lee, you may appreciate this. I think you're still with us, aren't you, Lee? Yeah. Uh, uh, Today, uh, if you all watch the news, you'll see something really strange. There, there was a uh, 
an accident at an airport. Two air, airplanes were coming in at the same time and they crashed before they got on the ground. Um, the, the one, and Lee, maybe you remember the name of the manufacturer. There is a small aircraft manufacturer. It was a little single engine plane and it, uh, it had a parachute built into the airplane. Um, so that when the plane is, say it again. Cirrus. Cirrus, that's it, yep. Uh, and people laughed when they first showed this design a few years ago, but yeah, it's an airplane that has a parachute. So in this case, after they crashed and it lost its engine, it was beat up, it was going to crash, it deployed its own parachute and they've got video of a parachute lowering an airplane from the sky safely onto, onto the ground and people on board are very much alive. So that was good. This is at yeah, which was, aerodrome? Pardon me? Which airfield? I didn't catch what city. Uh, like I say, it just happened this afternoon. So it was should it be North on. America or Europe? Um, I think North America. Again, I'm not sure. Okay. They weren't, the planes weren't headed in opposite directions, were they? They were trying to land on parallel runways. So I suspect <laughs> they were not going in opposite directions. No. But I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, I don't know what the who, Lee. You're a private pilot. I mean, you use parallel runways, but are they supposed to be um, like thirty seconds apart or something? Uh, parallel runways only have to be depending on where the VFR is. VFR, you can live with about what thousand feet, something like that. If they're IFR, you have to have a, a larger spacing if you want to run approaches simultaneously. <laughs> Which is why they added that huge runway out at Lambert that nobody uses today. You're, you're talking about lateral spacing. Correct. I'm talking about time delayed spacing so you don't touch down at the same time. Or it's not a requirement. You can both touch down at the same time. Uh, you can. The only the only reason you wouldn't is if you're uh, uh, allowing for wake turbulence. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Wind turbulence, right? No wake turbulence. Wait, 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 turbulence. Wake. Yeah, wait. wake turbulence, right. Yeah. Oh, okay, like the air swirls behind the airplanes. Wake the vortices. Yeah, it, it, if, it, 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 it comes off the wing. If the size of the 747, it can flip over a small airplane. Oh, you don't have to be that big, Steve. Any, any decent sized jet, you know, 757, uh, 727s. I don't know about DC nines; they're not too bad, but yeah, I think that they're called heavies, and it's usually the twin aisles, not the not the single aisle. But right, yeah, you know, they, they, they they have the worst wing tip vortices. But under under certain conditions, you know, a lot of smaller jets can do it too. It's a combination of speed, air density, and uh, uh, weight. No. Sure. By the way, the other aircraft uh, was a twin, and so it still had its one engine. It did manage to land on its own, uh, but the, uh, it has a huge hole from the left side to the right side. The whole chunk of the top of the plane is carved out and right in front of the right in front of the rudder, and uh, uh, I have no idea how that plane stayed together. <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, I like the one that lost the t half the roof out in Hawaii about oh, three years ago. Yep. Yeah, That's that was that convertible top 727? Uh, 737, I think. 737, correct, correct. Yeah, okay. that thing had no top from the floor up. Right. So does anyone else Steve. have any questions for uh, Steve? I have one more follow-up, uh, kind of going with what uh, Stanford was asking. So, uh, although we definitely appreciate your PDFs, when you learned this, did you just have to painfully learn it all on your own, or uh, did Red have have some training material on Kickstarter? Um, it was kind of on my own. Um, <clears throat> I have looked at uh, some of Red Hat's training. Um, it's kind of pricey I mean, they've got the certifications um and those if yeah it wouldn't really appropriate because they want uh i get spread out a lot 
in what I do. Like I don't just manage servers and build up little build VMs. I um, there's been times that I'll spend you know four or five years steady just working on C++ code for this particular product or you know some kind of system or another and uh then go back and oh, okay you know all the server stuff will kind of be in the background and uh years ago i would i kind of wanted to do some red hat certs but then it just never the opportunity and the free time never presented itself so yeah so it's been google away And once you once you find their support material online, it you can kind of get started fairly fairly quick. All right. Well, once again, a big thanks to Steve Gomez and also to Lee Lambert. Uh, it's a great presentation this evening. Great questions and comments from the crowd and. Uh, I guess uh, uh, Dan or Lee, whoever's got their finger on the record button, uh, I guess uh, uh, if you leave the recorder running for a bit, just in case people want to, um, I mean, you, 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 people want the recorder off or leave it on until everybody starts dropping off. It's 930. I think we should.